This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me here. And I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to talk in English, if it's okay. That's uh, what uh, was agreed before. Um, and I also want to congratulate the organizer for well timing the, the conference. Uh, they probably had good uh, foresight that Germans would uh, play uh, later today against the French. Uh, and uh, and uh, in that sense, I would, uh, we can see that academics sometimes have good oversights on, 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 on uh, foresights on, uh, on some, uh, some of the important events in life. Um, uh, I was asked to talk about uh, after crowd investing or life after crowd investing. And in particular, what happens when after the campaign is over, uh, potential issues that can arise. I'm not going to talk that much about regulation only a bit on the end. Uh, Lars has uh, talked a lot, a lot about this, especially the reforms already, so I'm only going to touch upon a few aspects. What I'm going to do is more discuss a few items, in particular in terms of second rounds, uh, exit strategy, and in particular uh, the um, anti-delusion provisions, so the delusion provisions that, uh, that do exist, and uh, the potential impact it may have. Um, Lars mentioned briefly why uh, crowd investing is uh, particularly interesting or important to look at from a regular perspective and that is a very distinct uh, um, type of crowdfunding than, than other forms. Uh, this, uh, this slide is actually supposed to uh, say uh, similar things that uh, he already uh, said but uh, in English. Um, so um, the interesting thing is that a few years ago when crowdfunding, crowd investing started, there were very few platforms present and most of the time people opened just a platform and did it on their own. There was a lot of variate, variation across uh, the different uh, campaigns. Uh, platforms have standardized this and uh, I think that has also contributed to the professionalization. Still there are a number of, uh, of uh, differences, so I'm uh, showing here the different forms of crowdfunding, donation, reward based, so reward based would be Kickstarter, profit sharing based, which would be like uh, Sandao, uh, you may know, so this is a Belgian uh, platform on comic books, Belgians like comic books. Uh, so there you can uh, sponsor a specific uh, comic book and uh, if it gets commercialized then you participate in the, re in the profits with the author at a certain fixed percentage up to four or five years. So it's a bit different uh, type of crowdfunding than, than what we're looking at today. Then you have the lending ones and then the securities ones. And there are at least uh, three different uh, reasons why uh, crowd investing, so the securities based uh, crowdfunding is, is, is important to look at. First is because uh, the risk involved is much greater. So these are investments in startups, innovative uh, and, uh, and uh, with promises on future cash flows. This is very different from donation based where you don't expect anything or reward based where the worst that could happen is that you don't get the product back but uh, or that uh, with, with, uh, with a lower quality or delayed. Uh, the amounts involved are much larger also. Uh, on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, the average amount is something like between ten and fifteen thousand dollars. Here uh, it's, it's well above hundred thousand the average that you see in Germany but also in France and elsewhere. So the amounts that are involved are much larger, also the tickets are much larger. And the other part is the complexity of contracts. The contracts are much more sophisticated, more detailed in securities-based uh, crowdfunding than, than the other, other forms. Not sure I need to spend a lot of time on this slide, but this is a slide that uh, Lars and I have, have done for, for a, a working paper. So uh, essentially the portals are there to intermediate. You have on the uh, left-hand side, which is also on your side, Left hand side is the issuer, the company that uh, either has a prospectus or not. Uh, on the right hand side you have the investors, which are the crowd, and uh, you have the crowd investing portal that intermediates. Uh, most of the uh, money transfer is handled outside due to, uh, to avoid specific regulations. Um, and uh, the portal proposes a template for the contract, uh, which is then uh, finalized with the issuer. And this 
offer is a take it or leave it offer. So the crowd can take it or, or, or leave it, but there is no negotiation as you have in venture capitalists and, and business angels. And the business model of uh, the platforms is that most of the revenue they generate is, is uh, success fees. We already have a couple of success stories. Um, one that I like to tell since I, I work in France is uh, Atabio. Atabio did a 300 euro, 300,000 euro campaign in 2010. This is a biotech company that works for, uh, for, uh, for drugs that treats uh, uh, specific bacteria. And uh, the exit took place about two years later and there was a return of 44% over the two years. Uh, the exit took place to the buyout by the uh, by angels. Uh, then you also have a couple of them that uh, have already a second and third financing round on seed match. A nice example is uh, Front Row Society that uh, just closed, I think, the last uh, third uh, round. Um, you have uh, some of them that also get even larger and larger numbers. Uh, with uh, Protonet, uh, who uh, recently raised 3 million euros. This is, is, is exceptional. Uh, even in France, there, there are no cases above 1 million euro yet. Uh, but um, uh, in, in Germany, the numbers are, are quite impressive. Uh, another nice example, which is not crowd, crowd investing, but crowdfunding through the Kickstarter that we discussed this morning at the other, other conference, is uh, Oculus Rift. Oculus Rift raised uh, two and a half million dollars uh, on Kickstarter to sell its first uh, uh, product and uh, it was eventually bought uh, uh, one and a half years later by Facebook for two billion dollars. Two billion dollars. So uh, these are nice success stories and showing that there is potential but of course there are also failures that we already have seen uh, a few in Germany, a few in France, that shows that, of course, these are risky, risky investments. Uh, the current uh, default rates are certainly not representative of the market because the market still needs to mature and we'll see in a few years what is the true default rate uh, in, in that market. Uh, before talking about anti-delusion uh, protection and, uh, and, and stage financing, uh, let me perhaps just here uh, very quickly mention uh, that uh, crowd investing is uh, in, in, in many respects not so different from venture capital and, uh, and, and business angel deals. Um, and uh, that should also highlight uh, how risky they are. And uh, I truly hope that the crowd understands the risk that, that it involves. But it also shows that uh, many of the difficulties about anti-delusion, stage financing are exactly the same as venture capitalists. So the problems that some of the companies today face are not specific to crowd investing. They are just for the type of companies that, that are being financed. Uh, it's just that VCs and business angels tend to be knowledgeable and experienced in dealing with these problems. So first of all, these are risky investments in innovative, often high growth firms. Uh, some fail, many fails perhaps, we don't know. Only a few really succeed and uh, and uh, we hope that they, uh, they make up for the losses. So, um, um, and that these uh, big, uh, big, big successes then, uh, which are a few of them, make a big multiple to cover, uh, cover the rest. So it's a bit like uh, Superstars Economic, where you try to, not like lottery games, but you try to pick up some, some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, uh, some successes or some very promising one, but you know that there will be many of them who fail. Uh, most of the gain accrue at the end, I mean, uh, so essentially after a few years at the exit. That's very important because uh, it means that the distribution of the return comes much later and therefore the current revenues they, these companies have at the time of investment is just not representative. Uh, these investments are liquid, so investors need to be very impatient and also the exit stage will, will become very crucial. Uh, and uh, this is certainly something that will come up uh, the next uh, one or two years uh, in, in some of these companies. Also, they require special care when drafting contracts since uh, these are young, innovative startup with a lot of uncertainty. And uh, venture capitalists, business angels have developed contracts 
uh, that allowed to solve or, or to, to mitigate much of the agency problems and, and the information asymmetry problems. Um, funding occurs in rounds, very important. Fun Funded, funding by, by stages has a number of advantages. I'll come back to this in, in a few minutes. But, uh, uh, but uh, the main reason is also that it allows to minimize risk. So you start with a small amount. You see what the entrepreneur can produce. And if it goes well, you finance the next round. Uh, this limits very much the risk. There are also, of course, differences. One of the main differences is the types of securities. Um, venture capital, so far I know, don't buy Partial, uh, and Darlene, or, or, uh, or other uh, types of, of participating notes. They buy convertible preferred shares, uh, or if they buy common shares, they bundle it with some other types of, of securities like warrants uh, that uh, allow them to get a lot of voting rights um, and participate in the upside, but also get some protection on the downside, essentially with preferred shares. Uh, you get uh, to have a higher priority over the entrepreneur, and if things go well, you get the, the upside. A few uh, platforms offer these kind of securities, essentially convertible bonds, which I think are very promising because, uh, because they solve a number of problems that, that uh, we have in other securities, such as potentially uh, those used in, in Germany. Also, difference are the, the extent of due diligence, negotiation, and the provision of expertise beyond the investment. Um, so this, uh, this leads to, to one of the first main, main topic that, uh, that uh, um, I would like to, to discuss, which are anti-delusion provisions, which has been quite contentious and, and, and a hot debate in, in the crowd investing uh, uh, arena to see to which extent the crowd should get these kind of provisions. So what is the main concern? Well, the main concern is, uh, as I write it, what happens if the firm, so the entrepreneurial firm, needs to raise extra capital in the future, but the firm is worth less than it is, uh, in the future it was less than it is worth today. So essentially they're selling securities in the future that are, war that are at lower price than today. So the valuation did not go up in contrast to expectation, but the company is worth much less than today. So the, the this means that the investors in the first round will have paid much more for the shares than the new shareholders in the second round that come in. This, of course, makes uh, investors in the first round very unhappy, uh, not just because they lost uh, money, because, but uh, they got uh, highly diluted. Um, there's, by the way, a different distinction, of course, between economic delusion and percentage delusion. So percentage delusion will always happen because if you issue new shares on the second follow-up round, in percentage-wise, first-round investors must be diluted. This is, this is uh, uh, just uh, by, by the, 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 the principle of stage financing. What we talk more here is the economic delusion. So the shares that I bought in the first round at a certain price, give me a certain value for my holding. And the question is, is this holding worth the same thing in the next round or not? If it's worth less, then, uh, then it, it, it's, it's due to the fact that, uh, that the value of the company went down. So uh, early investors often request uh, delusion protections. Uh, and of course, this, uh, this uh, only makes sense if there's what we call a down round. So the valuation went down. If the company went well, there's no reason to compensate or to, to give extra shares or compensation to, uh, to early investors. It's only if there was a bad event that happened, what we call a down round. Uh, and then depending on the kind of securities, like venture capitals, they would have convertible preferred. Uh, they would get just extra shares or the conversion price would, would be changed so that uh, eventually they get more shares and therefore have a larger equity stake in the firm. Um, and they would get this uh, in the, the course of the anti-delusion provision. Uh, there are a number of benefits of having these anti-delusion provisions. So let me focus on the two most important ones. Uh, one is, of course, to limit the risk of, uh, of the securities holder. Okay, so uh, this means that if there's a, things don't go as expected, they are protected, they get extra shares, so they suddenly get a larger fraction of the value. Um, of course, this comes at the expense of, of um, of those who do not have the anti-delusion provisions, 
And typically, these are the founders. So the money, it, it's a zero-sum game, these anti-delusion provisions. It's value that is transferred from the founders who do not have such kind of protection that goes to, to, the, to the securities holders who have anti-delusion provisions. So the crowd holding that would uh, benefit of it, but the, the, the one who pays for it, the, who bears the risk, is, is, is the founder. The other reason that uh, makes uh, fully sense to use anti-delusion provision is because uh, often there are informational problems, or information asymmetries, Lars mentioned before, or you may just have disagreements about valuations. So very often you can see, uh, uh, especially in venture capital, uh, because that's where you have negotiation, in crowd investing there's no real negotiation, but you have a disagreement of valuation, of, on the valuation. The entrepreneur may think his company is worth 10 million euros, while the investor says, well, you know, let's start with something more reasonable, with 5 million. Uh, part of this is, of course, uh, due to the bargaining uh, that, that, takes, uh, that takes place. But at the end of the day, then still there may be substantial differences in beliefs about the true potential. Um, either because the entrepreneur has better information, better knowledge, or because they just have different beliefs. So in typical situation, you would just have no investment because they cannot agree on, on the valuation. And if they cannot agree on the valuation, they don't agree on the price. And if you don't agree on the price, well, you know, you, you feel that you're not getting uh, what, what you deserve. Um, so um, then anti-delusion provision are useful because they help investors to still make an investment although they disagree in valuation. To give you just a very simple example, so this is not uh, with, uh, with Partiar, uh, with uh, and Dalin, but, but just uh, in shares um, to, to make uh, the point very simple. Suppose you have a first investment round for 1 million euro, and um, uh, or th there is a, a first round uh, investment, but uh, investors and entrepreneurs don't agree on the valuation. The entrepreneur thinks his company is worth 10 million, okay, post money valuation, and the investor truly believes it's just worth half of it, 5 million. Um, it still makes sense to uh, strike a deal uh, if you give the investor anti delusion provision because anti delusion provision is a mechanism that allows you to ex post make adjustments. Here are the examples, so when the company started, uh, is, is incorporated, the entrepreneur of course holds 100%, so this is a seed stage. In the first round, then they need to decide uh, how much to give to the investor. Uh, the investor can say, okay, let's work with your valuation. You entrepreneur, you believe really it's 10 million, let's work with this. Then uh, if it's ten, worth 10 million post money valuation, investor should get 10%. This is uh, the 10% you have here, so, um, and, and the, uh, the entrepreneur 90%. And uh, then let's suppose that the investor gets the anti-delusion <laughs> protection. So later on, the next round, we know whether it was 10 or 5 million because new information was, was revealed, and you can put this valuation based on, on, on the second round of financing. So if it really turns out that the company is worth 10 million, then uh, then uh, the investor got what he deserves. 10% of 10 million is 1 million. He ejected 1 million, he gets value for 1 million. The entrepreneur gets the rest, which is 90%, so 9 million. If, however, the entrepreneur is wrong and it's only worth 5 million, then uh, the anti delusion provision would uh, enter into play and would increase the percentage. Uh, share of, of the investor, and particularly it should be such a way that he again gets uh, 1 million, which just corrects for the fact that if in the first place they would have started to work with 5 million, he should have at the beginning got 20%. So the anti-delusion provision allows you to correct ex post based on the new information that comes out and give extra shares, extra percentage to the investor so that eventually he gets 20%. 20% of 5 million is 1 million. So he's, he gets his fair, fair value and uh, it's therefore a mechanism to ex post uh, just correct for the disagreement. So it typically also helps or to avoid entrepreneurs to inflate too much their valuation. 
uh, investors like to have anti-delusion provisions uh, as a way to, to protect against uh, over-optimistic entrepreneurs. And uh, it can, in crowd investing, also help make sure that the valuation that they are proposed by entrepreneurs on the platform uh, to first avoid that the entrepreneur exaggerates and second that if the, it's, it's wrong or it has been inflated that uh, the crowd becomes, uh, gets protected. The cost, as I mentioned, is of course excessive delusion uh, of those who do not have such a provision and particularly it's the founder who is the person who needs to work actually. Okay? Investors are just waiting for their money. Um, uh, so uh, there may be some issues about incentives in the future if there's excessive delusion. Uh, it's also going to affect the terms under which follow-up uh, funding can be raised. Giving too much anti-delusion protection to uh, early investors will make it much more difficult to raise funds in the future because, because you got very generous term in the first round. Um, one way um, that investors often uh, uh, introduce the anti-delusion protection venture capital and business angel that I haven't seen for crowd investing yet, but that I think could be an interesting uh, area, a way to do it, is also to uh, link it to a pay-to-play provision. So the pay-to-play provision says that if the investor wants to have his extra shares from the anti-delusion provision in case of a down round, he needs to invest in the NOFA, he needs to participate in the follow-up round. By forcing the crowd to invest in the follow-up round, then uh, the crowd gives a signal that they still believe in the project um, and, uh, and uh, offer a strong, uh, a strong uh, uh, um, certification of, of the project in, in later rounds. Also in terms of covenants, I haven't seen much uh, going on, but exit is very important because most of the revenue comes at the exit uh, period. And, um, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised that entrepreneurs in many of these startups will be reluctant to, uh, to offer an exit venue to, to uh, existing investors so quickly. One is that the most important exit route very often is the sale of the company itself. Uh, in venture capital is the, most, the two most important exit routes are uh, IPOs, so public listing, in which case all the shares are listed and uh, investors can gradually sell his own shares. Or, and that's uh, percentage-wise the most important one, is a trade sale. So the company is being sold to another competitor or larger group. Entrepreneurs may be reluctant to sell their, their, their baby, their, their company, and uh, therefore uh, uh, not be so, so, so prone in pushing for exit, and therefore giving exit uh, possibilities to, uh, to the crowd is, is, or, or those who, who, who invested uh, is, is clearly important. I list here a number of covenants on exits, but I think uh, I'm not going to have much time discussing them. But, uh, but uh, I, I think that's uh, clearly something important and that uh, in crowd investing uh, contracts still needs to be, uh, be, uh, be uh, solved is uh, giving enough uh, right for exits to, to, the, uh, to the investors, crowd investors in the future. In terms of stage financing, and that comes uh, back to what um, Lars said before. Um, so stage financing here, when you have a very low threshold like 100,000 euro, can potentially become problematic. Um, so again, stage financing has the, the nice thing is that you give a certain, uh, you inject the first uh, a certain amount of money that's relatively small. You let the entrepreneur work and, 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 and show, the, show some progress before follow-up uh, fundraising is, is, uh, is uh, provided. And uh, in this graph here, you can see there are some uh, blue and, uh, and green uh, uh, arrows. So the, um, uh, the, the, the green one is as the company evolves, technological market risk goes down. So that's the, the green one. And the blue one are the stages of development of the company and the product. Uh, and as you move on these uh, stage of development, typically the capital requirements go up. In the case of crowdfunding, they invest uh, at the very beginning, which is completely here at the right, which is when risk is the highest, but also the capital requirements are lowest. But this means the crowd takes enormous amount of risk more than the follow-up investors. And uh, um, Lars mentioned before that uh, one benefit of, um, of increasing the, uh, 
the uh, the threshold of, for the exemptions from 100,000 is um, is, uh, is is that uh, it allows firms to raise large amounts of money and not inefficiently low ones. Uh, the other obvious uh, benefit of increasing it is that uh, if you increase it, so you push the the, the red line more to, to the right, you also allow into the crowd investing platforms more advanced, more developed companies, companies that already solve some of its risk, and uh, you offer to the crowd investment opportunities in a bit more developed companies who require more uh, capital, but, but uh, also have lower, lower risk. So it's likely by increasing the uh, this threshold that you're going to have a different composition of companies also and overall less risky. I know how much time I have left, but uh, 10, no? Okay, good. <laughs> um, in terms of stage financing, some uh, potential issues is also that, um, um, uh, that um, as, as the funds are, are injected gradually, new decisions need to be, be taken and uh, uh, one thing that makes venture capitalists uh, make profit is because uh, they, they can, they're willing, uh, hopefully, to, uh, to, to, to pull the plug relatively early. So what does it mean? It means that if they make a first round and they're not convinced, they just stop. Uh, can the crowd also pull the plug if needed? Will they do it, uh, given that some of them make decisions that go beyond financial uh, uh, reasons? Alternatively, you can also see that financing rounds taking place where the first round investors finance the second one because no outside investor is willing to provide extra money because uh, the company made some progress but not as much as, as they would have wanted. So no new investor wants to come in, so existing investors need to finance it. Uh, there you can again ask the question, can the, the crowd coordinate injecting the extra funds if no new uh, investors will, will, will want to come. This is uh, no obvious uh, 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 question because typically you also see in venture capital deals when there are too many venture capitalists, they may want to free ride and, uh, and uh, let the others provide the funding for this company that didn't do so well but that uh, is still worth continuing. Um, the, the bigger the crowd, the more likely some will want to free ride on, on the others. The other uh, part that makes also stage financing difficult for the crowd is that uh, every stage there is a new shareholder agreement that needs to be signed. And uh, uh, not only is this more difficult if you have a lot of people around the table, but it also alters the allocation of power and control rights over time. Business angels often understand that they may get some control rights in the first round, but in later rounds they have to give it up. Uh, last mentioned, uh, and, and that uh, goes back to, uh, to uh, my main topic, is, is investor protection. Um, last mentioned a uh, number of uh, regulatory needs, and I must say I'm very much in favor of the same, uh, the same uh, initiatives. Uh, but I think also that a lot of it must come from the platforms themselves. So self-regulation of platforms that uh, will affect investor protection will, uh, will certainly also be uh, very beneficial to, uh, to promoting crowd investing. So some form that platforms already do is, for instance, uh, enforce high minimum tickets to restrict the investor access. Some platforms allow you to invest, start investing with one or five euros, but others you need to invest a minimum of a few thousand, a thousand euros uh, so that eventually the, the platform to, to avoid having regular, regular crowd decides to, uh, to put a very high ticket so that they only work with wealthy individuals. And uh, we have actually looked last and I uh, on, on uh, empirically on some of these platforms, the composition of the crowd, and clearly this is not a homogeneous group. Uh, you have uh, some regular crowds, but then you have also a few very wealthy individuals who provide a large fraction of the deal. One of the platforms uh, I know uh, stylized this very nicely. He said, well, on my platform, 50% of the money comes from 5% of the investors. 
So it means that 95% of the investors are so small, they provide small tickets, so that uh, they only add up to 50% of the money. And then you have a small 5% of individuals who provide the other half of it. And they can provide very large tickets. And uh, many f uh, often platforms depend very much on these few wealthy individuals to make uh, the, the campaign successful. Uh, another uh, self-regulation or, or restructuring that uh, is, becomes more and more common, uh, not so much in Germany but in other countries, is pooling of investments. So it means that uh, the crowd doesn't invest anymore directly in the startup, but uh, the platform sets up a pool, uh, a company, and the crowd invests in that company, and the company then invests in the startup. So this, from the startup perspective, uh, there's only one shareholder coming in. And this can take different forms. Uh, in Simbid in, in the Netherlands, this is a cooperative that, that is built every time. On Campanisto, it's a GmbH, uh, which is actually a single one for all of them, while on Simbid, for each separate deal, there's a different cooperative. On, on YC, it's a Société Action Simplifiée, so a relatively simple company. And on my microinvest in Brussels, uh, it's a Société Anonyme, so it must be a AG, I guess. Uh, so it's a kind of company that you can also bring on the stock market. Um, also, more and more, there's internal selection of candidates uh, to improve due diligence. Some of them have a member's vote. Uh, so that members can vote, and if they get enough votes, it can, can become, uh, get on the platforms. Others uh, build up investment committees uh, to, to improve the due diligence, not just for the crowd, but also the platform themselves. Others also in, improve the information disclosure beyond regulation by proposing uh, templates. I think this is important because, first, the templates helps uh, to improve transparency because uh, the comparability across investment opportunities is, is then easier, but it can also potentially reduce information asymmetry so that um, the crowd can make uh, uh, better investment opportunities. From the platform perspective, uh, uh, this uh, is also in their benefit because if, if uh, there's a lot of information asymmetry going on, um, then uh, good candidates do good companies don't want to go to these platforms because they don't want to be pulled, bundled together with, with uh, less good firms. So it's also in the benefit of, of platforms to, uh, to reduce as much as possible information asymmetry. An interesting case um, <coughs> is the case of my microinvest in, in, in Belgium. They actually mix both pooling and, uh, and this uh, due diligence improving. Uh, they, uh, they offer the crowd a co-investment scheme where uh, at the first step business angels commit to, um, uh, to, to make part of the investment. So it can be uh, uh, 30, 40, 50 percent of, of the amount. And when the company goes uh, to start the campaign, they already say we already have commitment for X percent of the money from business angels who do the due diligence on us and they're willing to invest. And then the crowd then provides the rest, and the rest is essentially pulled in a, in a Société Anonyme, which is called My Microinvest uh, Finance. Um, this slide is, is essentially very similar, as, as Lau just mentioned. I, I think uh, um, a small offer exemptions threshold uh, uh, at, at 100,000 uh, euro is potentially problematic. Uh, uh, because uh, because you're limiting uh, the the access to the most risky startups, and um, and uh, you see that in some uh, some platforms, especially in, in Germany, that uh, platforms end up offering securities like this Partiarische Nachrang Darlin that they may not have offered in the first place in, if they were in an unconstrained uh, a case. Uh, in France, we uh, we have been pushing for light documentation. Uh, so the, the regulation or the, con the consultation document proposes a clear list of items that must be included um, and uh, I think this will improve uh, for the transparency and, com and comparability. Um, further challenges uh, for platforms but certainly also for regulators uh, before, before I, uh, I, I conclude. 
Um, I think there are a number of also upcoming trends that are important to consider and that are likely to uh, impact investor protection. One is that uh, crowd investing campaigns are likely to impact also business angel networks. Um, it's quite likely that some of the business angels will migrate to platforms. They may precisely be the, the wealthy individuals, these 5% that also participate in, in uh, crowd investing platforms and provide a large amounts. Um, from discussion with some of these business angel networks, uh, I know that some of them are concerned that uh, at the end of the day, crowd investing platforms offer larger deal flow than, than their own network and, and uh, that business angels potentially need to find new services to, make, uh, to, to differentiate them from, from crowd investing. Market fragmentation in Europe, so currently market fragmentation is important because uh, prospectus regulation is implemented differently, but the fact that each regulation, each in the regulation each member state in the European Union is so different, as Lars has evidenced, French um, um, regulate the platforms as well as the issuers, uh, Italians the companies, the, so the, the, uh, the, the startups, others do it in a very different way. In Belgium it's only the, the crowd. This is potentially going to reinforce or, or even further push the market fragmentation because it will become even more difficult to make an issuance cross-border because when you go cross-border you also need to comply with their, their uh, requirements. Another trend that I, I, I think will, will happen is uh, cross-border activities. Uh, some platforms are, are setting up to become pan-European uh, platforms. I think uh, Companisto has, has this uh, objective but some UK platforms clearly uh, started to do that. Uh, an interesting case that I like to say since I live in Belgium and, and work in France is that uh, uh, recently two French startups, rather than raising their money in France, they started to raise in Belgium, in Brussels. Uh, so they avoided the French platforms, they just raised it on, on the on Belgian platform. So there may be a, an issue of startups themselves trading off the different platforms depending on their jurisdictions and where they are. Um, and uh, the UK, in the UK, several platforms have raised quite a lot of large amounts of money to, uh, to uh, develop their cross-border activities. Finally, create viable exit opportunities are, 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 are very, very important. So um, I think I went over, over time, uh, but uh, again, just to summarize this, uh, I think for uh, Germany, uh, regulation uh, currently does not allow, in my view, much flexibility in, in the contract due to restrictive prospectus exemption um, and, uh, and uh, some more flexibility for platforms may be uh, certainly uh, worthwhile that could be done on these exemptions. Uh, however, in terms of investor uh, protection, I think many of the solutions will need to come from, from platforms themselves, not just from regulation. I think self-regulation is also extremely important in, in that area because if uh, it gets highly regulated as much as banks or, or any other securities issuance, there's no differentiation between banks or, 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 or traditional IP, uh, securities issuance and, and this one. And, and uh, uh, crowd investing can only work if it can differentiate itself and this calls for a scalable regulation um, that, uh, that uh, uh, that is currently also being implemented in different countries. Okay, thanks. Thank